Amen. Hallelujah. How's everybody doing this morning? So, I made a commitment that I'm going to uh, always obey the Holy Spirit, so we're going to do something different this morning. And for those of y'all that don't understand it, just pray with us. So, how many of you have a prayer language? How many of you have a prayer language? We stand up, please. We're going to pray in the Spirit right now for everything that is coming against everything that we stand for in our city, in our homes, in our church, and I want you to pray in your prayer language, and for those of you that don't understand it, don't freak out, it's okay, we'll explain it to you. We're praying in the spirit, we're going to be praying in tongues, and it's a spirit language where only God can understand, okay? And if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God to fill you right now, and you will. And we're just going to pray, and just let it, let it go, let it fly, as loud as you want, as hard as you want, and we'll just let it be. So start praying. So por ahora sacar a de ese que oro los hombres para de si quiero se te tapa y ahora está todo hora si quiero son para de de quería yo todo eres de de se te topa para de si qui quería yo todo son para de hasta todo lo patata hora de la sede los hombres para de si quiero yo todo la pata de si quiere de si todo hora hasta te tapa para te de hora han para de si todo si quiere de si te lo para de si quería yo todo son para de si hora de hasta te quiero yo todo la pere de hasta te hora hasta te hero son para de si quería yo todo hora hasta te Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just like the, the disciples who were in the upper room in Acts chapter 2, they were standing in one accord, they were praying in one accord, and you fell like fire. Lord, we're asking you to fall like fire upon our church, upon our minds, our hearts, our spirits, our hearts, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we're standing here, praying in the Spirit, in one accord, believing for everything good, everything perfect, and everything holy, that you're calling to us in our church, in our homes, in our cities, Father God, that you bring it in right now. Holy Spirit, this is all about you this is who you are this is what you've called us to be and to do oh shut up and Father, I pray right now for everybody who is not filled with the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues, Lord. I'm praying in the name of Jesus that you fill them now, that you engulf them, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, you fall upon them right now. In corporate worship, Father God, as we're praying in one accord and standing in agreement for the one purpose, one cause, one goal, to know you and make you known. And we're standing here today. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just raise your hand and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. We're not forcing it on you, but if you don't speak in tongues, it doesn't make you a less Christian. If you do speak in tongues, it doesn't make you more spiritual. It's a prayer language that we have, that we speak to the Lord, that only He can understand. So just raise your hands and just start speaking the things that are in His, coming out of your mouth. The symbols, the words, the signs, just start saying it. Just let it come out. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We will never deny you, Holy Spirit. We cry out to you this morning, Father, that you search us, Lord. Search us in our hearts, as King David said. See if there be any wicked way in us, Father, so we can purge that out this morning, so we can come before you holy and blameless and union and unity and one accord with you, Father, in your will and the visions that you have for us in our church, in our homes, and in our city. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you're doing. And we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise this morning. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. 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 Just a little side note, I was praying in tongues on the way to drop Sarah off to school one day, my daughter, and I was just praying in the spirit. And when I got done, she said, Daddy, and I said, what? She said, I didn't know you could speak Spanish. <laughs> and I said, yeah, baby, I did. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to ask my uh, campus pastors to come up this morning. Dwayne, Tammy, Brother Bob, um, Pastor Eloy Huerta, he's not here today, he's at work. So, welcome, welcome. These are the campus pastors. I know sometimes we, yes, praise God for them. They live above reproach. I love their hearts. I love how they're always making themselves available, not just to me, but everybody in the congregation. They go above and beyond what anybody has ever asked them. They take their walk serious. They study. They're always in the book. If you gotta, if, and I'm bringing them up because I want everybody to know it ain't just me. We got a whole team, okay? They pray just as hard. And at any given moment, if I fall out in the Holy Spirit, one of these guys are going to come up and girls, and they're going to take over. So just get ready. But I wanted y'all to have a good idea of who our pastors are. So if you have questions or you have something and you can't get to me, then they, they speak on my behalf as well. I trust them with my whole heart, and I love them with all my heart. And uh, thank you so much, guys. Pastor Eloy is a little weird. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm going to tell him I said that. So last week we, we talked about um, the promise of goodness. And it was the last sermon in our series on God's promises. And how many of you experienced God's goodness this week? How many of you can you raise your hands and say, I experienced some goodness in my life? Or how many of you received a blessing that you know good and well you didn't deserve because of the lifestyle we were living, huh? Yeah, yeah, them hands went down quick, but I see. Yes, amen. Uh, maybe it was something new. Maybe you got a, a new house that you didn't think you were going to get. Maybe it was a, a new car that you weren't expecting to get and God opened the doors. Or maybe it was a job you've been praying about. Uh, maybe somebody had offended you and come back and apologized. Uh, see, we oftentimes, we think of God's goodness and we tie it in with material things. When in reality, we, God's goodness is way beyond anything material. How many, how many times have you stopped and asked God or said, thank you, God, for the things that you haven't given me? The blessings, the spiritual blessings, keeping sicknesses from you, keeping you from accidents and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, and maybe somebody asked you for forgiveness. Psalms 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of your, my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So how many of you want goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life? That comes by living a holy and righteous life before the king. Not just on Sundays, but in your homes, when you're out shopping, when you're out with your friends late at night. Uh, we went and had dinner last night, me and Daryl. And it was kind of last minute, and he said, hey, let's just go, uh, go eat some Olive Garden. And we're sitting there talking, and one thing I told Daryl, I said, look, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying, Daryl. I said, uh, Jesus has just told Peter and Paul that they are so lucky that me and you weren't alive back in the day because they wouldn't even be known. Amen? That's how much I love my brother. That's how on fire he is for the Lord. Amen? Um, this week we're talking about uh, a two-week ser sermon series, and then I'm going to be out two Sundays after that, just so you know. Pastor Dwayne will be bringing the word. I'm really excited about that. Yes. Really excited about that. Um, so turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. I read it and read it and read it and read it and was trying to memorize the entire thing last night, and I got most of it, but I'm going to go ahead and read it just so I don't fumble my words up, Okay. But I want you to turn to Luke chapter 15. And I'm going to read it, and then we're going to get on with the sermon. Luke chapter 15. Everybody say amen when you get there. The parable of the lost son, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted all his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. 
Then he went and journeyed and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, I will go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Remember, he left saying, give me, and he came back saying, make me. We're going to talk about that. And he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house he heard music and dancing so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant and he said to him your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to him, his father, Hey, these many years I have been serving you, and I have trans never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours who has devoured your livelihood with harlots and killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and he was lost and is found. Let's pray. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We give you glory and honor, Lord. I pray as the words that come out of my mouth and we live through these moments and times of this prodigal son and, and the attitude of the son, of the older brother, and of the father, Lord. I pray that you would let this resonate in our hearts, that it bring out the things in our lives that maybe we have buried, and come and, and just lay them at the foot of the cross, Lord, so we can be in agreement with where you're calling us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The younger son said, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So, and I wanted to ask, first thing I wanted to ask you is why is that phrase so important? Why is it so important that the younger son says to his father when he said, give me my inheritance? The reason it was so important is because an inheritance is something that you received after somebody died. So what this younger son was basically was saying to his father is, hey, dad, you're dead to me. Give me what is mine and let me go my way. Give me what is mine. So I want to ask you this morning, how many of you have said to your heavenly father, I know you're going to all say you have never said it, but I'm asked the question anyways because I want to prove a point. How many of you have ever said to your heavenly father, you are dead to me with words that came out of your mouth? Anybody going to own that? Raise your hands. I never have said that. I've cussed at God. I've, I've accused him of taking everything good and perfect in my life, and I've walked away from him, but I've never said you're dead to me. So how many of you have ever said those exact words? What the prodigal son was telling his father is, I know better what's best for my life than you know what's better for me. So I'm going to do my will over your will. So maybe you haven't said to God, you're dead to me with your words, but maybe you've said it with your actions. Maybe you've said to God, I'm going to do my will over your will with my actions. You may not have uh, verbally spoke it, but you're physically living it. And I would ask you right now, if you think that's not true, look at your life right now. Are you living in the will that God has for your life? Are you living the righteous life? Are you living the way God told you to live and doing his will? Or are you still running towards Nineveh like Jonah did? What the prodigal son was telling his father, and so often we do the same thing, is I know what's better for my life than what you do. And some of you in here today are still running from God. You're still running from the things that God has called you to do. And some of them ain't even that big. 
Some of them, all it's going to take is just a little bit of time and effort for you to get involved with, but you're still so caught up in your life, your will, your emotions, that everything that you think you know is right and perfect and holy for your life, and you're not letting God have a chance to bring his goodness and his blessings and his mercy in your life. And that's when you find yourself in this cycle of life and you keep going around the same mountain like the Israelites for 40 years because they wouldn't let God rule their life. They knew what was better for their own selves. They complained every day. We want to go back into slavery. We want to go back and be in bondage. At least we were prisoners, but at least we got meat and bread every day. I guess they got tired of God's goodness and provision for the manna and the quail that he was providing for them. So because of their hardness of their heart, they spent 40 years wandering around the same desert until that generation died off. They weren't even allowed to go in the promised land. We find ourselves going around the same mountain of sickness because of the lifestyles that we live. We find ourselves constantly being sick. We find ourselves... um, constantly having financial strain or or marriage problems because we're not letting God be number one in our life and I hear it all the time it takes 50 50 in a marriage no it doesn't it takes 100 times 100 times 100 it ain't about me and you if God ain't the center of your marriage you've already missed the mark it takes three the prodigal son put his will put his will, his desires, his wants, his needs over the Father's will, and by doing so, that put him in open rebellion. Do y'all know what open rebellion is? It's willingly walking away from what God has called you to do. When he calls you to do something, no matter if it's a spiritual thing or a physical thing, if it's to give $1,000 or $100, if it's to buy somebody a car, new tires, it doesn't matter. If you're not doing what God says to do, you are in rebellion. That's why it's so important that you are filled with the Holy Spirit because there's other spirits that roam around that would lead you and guide you. And if you're not being led by the Holy Spirit, then what are you being led by? And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. How many witches do we have in here this morning? Because if you, and, you, and you, I heard some chuckles, but that's, that's true. If you're in open rebellion, the Bible says you're practicing witchcraft. And the only people I know that practice witchcraft are witches. Just a thought. Nobody raised your hand, so that's a good sign. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And stubbornness is as the iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. I I understand this is the prophet Samuel. I understand he's talking to Saul because Saul went and sacrificed, put himself in the place of of, uh, a spiritual authority when he didn't have spiritual authority, set himself in the place as a priest, claiming something God never called him to do. So he did it anyways without the authority. And because he rejected the word of God, Samuel says God's gonna remove him from kingship. But I would also wanna add that if if the truth be told, some of y'all are living in open rebellion and doing what you wanna do rather than what God wants you to do. When the prodigal son went his way, instead of his father's way, what he did was remove himself from his father's protection. Did you ever think about that? He had his father's protection when he was doing what he needed to be doing. He removed himself from his father's direction when he removed himself out from under the kingship, the umbrella of the Lord, and he removed himself from the father's provision. And the same thing applies to us. Look, there's, a, there's this thing that goes around, right? There's this umbrella. If you, if you look at our walk and Christian walk is the umbrella. It's God, family, ministry. And so many times we get that so messed up. We put God, ministry, and family. That's not how it's supposed to be. How good is our life's gonna be if we stand before Jesus Christ on the judgment day and we give an account and say, oh my gosh, you've won 100 million people to Christ, but your family went to hell in a handbasket because you devoted your life to the ministry and not your children. It's important. I'm passionate about that. You have to put your family first. God, not, I'm not saying make them God. God is always gonna be number one in your life, but your family will always and should always come before any ministry you're involved with. They are your first ministry. Raising your kids up to love Jesus isn't an option. It's a way that we have to live our life because the world is not gonna wait for you to tell your kids that Jesus is real. They're already telling them that he ain't through our history books, through our schools, through our government. They're trying to take everything good and perfect and holy that God has instituted for us as parents to teach our kids and they're throwing it out the window and saying, 
evolution, Big Bang, all this, you know, and, and the kids are believing it. And so what we have is a generation of confused people. And why are they confused? Because we're not taking our walk serious at home with our kids. How many of you pray with your kids every single day? Every single day. How many of you husbands and wife lock hands and pray? Pray over your children. Pray over your marriage. Pray over your home. Pray over your finances. It's not a matter of if, if, if the devil's going to try and attack it. It's a matter of when. Because if you're standing for righteousness and you're standing for holiness and you're saying, I am a Christian, I'm a born again believer in Jesus Christ and everything's going to come against you. You don't have to think it's going to happen. It is going to happen. So we have to put it in you, get it in us before it happens. Because the only thing that's going to keep us out of trouble when, when these hard times come is the blood of Jesus. So if you're not praying with your spouse every single day, I would encourage you, pray with your husbands, pray with your wives, pray with your children. you got to have that level of protection over your home. Don't just assume anything. Take the uh, initiative. Push forward. Be aggressive. Make things happen. Talk about the hard subjects. When we go our own way, we remove ourselves from God's protection. And there ain't no protection greater than God's protection. Amen? Would y'all agree with that? There ain't no protection greater than the protection of the Lord. Um, and if he can't find men and women to stand up and fight with you, what's he going to do? He'll go to a valley of dry bones, and he'll raise up a whole army from dead bones to come and fight with you. Amen? And if, we don't, if they won't do it, he'll make the rocks cry out. Now, how sad is that, that our God that created the heavens and the earth has to go and find rocks to cry out to him and praise him because his creation won't do it? That humbles me. I try to praise him all the time. I, I usually do it silently because people don't like to hear my voice. I don't like, <laughs> that was supposed to be funny. Um, <laughs> Second Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. When you cry out to God, he will protect you. He will save you. He will keep things from happening. That doesn't mean you're going to live a perfect and holy life. That doesn't mean when you become a Christian, none of the bad stuff happens. I would, I would go as far as to say that more bad stuff happens when you get saved. Because the Apostle Paul says that everything we do is going to be tested by fire. Your ministry, your family, your children, the words that you speak, everything's going to go through the fire so it can be refined. So then it can be perfect. So then it can be holy and, and be where it needs to be. Psalms 140 verse 4 says, Keep me safe, Lord, from the hand of the wicked. Protect me from the violent who devise ways to trip my feet. So, Satan's always going to have a plan and a purpose to come against you, your family, and your kids. When we go our, our own way, we remove ourselves from God's direction. How many of you have ever been removed from God's direction? Just kind of wandering aimlessly, doing your own thing, spending money like you, you know, you on a, a money tree. That's what my kids think. Every time they want something, daddy, just put it on the card. Okay, <laughs> exactly. You don't know what you're saying. Um, when, we, we, when, when we go our own way, <laughs> we remove ourselves from God's direction. If God ain't directing you, I would ask the question, church, this morning, what is directing you? Who is directing you? If you ain't being led by the Spirit, what are you being led by? I can understand if you're not born again. I can understand if you don't have a faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're being led by the world. There's, those are the only two options. But as born again believers, as men and women who stand up here every week and post stuff on Facebook every week and send messages and scriptures and text messages about God and Jesus, are you being led by the Spirit? It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to live it, to be about it. Psalms, um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. He will direct your paths if you trust in him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with everything that's in you, all your, your will, your, your desires, your emotions. Give that to God. Let him handle it because I can promise you he created it. He can do a much better job at managing your will and your emotions than we can. And he'll direct your paths. 
And it's important that he directs your paths um, because he'll lead you to doors that he wants open and he'll lead you to doors that he wants closed. And when you're walking the way that God wants you to walk, he's gonna take you where he wants you to go. And that's the hard for us because from the beginning of time, we've been created to dominate. We've been created to have dominion, to, to have what we want, when we want it, to take authority, to be in charge. And that's hard to surrender to a God that sometimes we don't even see, but we know he's there because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. But that's where your faith comes in, that I'm going to believe God. And instead of making decisions and, and making these snap decisions, I'm going to take some time and pray. When's the last time you fasted? When's the last time you fasted? Not for weight loss, that don't count. I'm talking a spiritual fast where you got before your face and said, you know what, Lord? I can, I can only do one meal, but I'm gonna spend this one meal and I'm gonna, instead of eating, I'm gonna spend my time in prayer. And even if you don't speak, I'm gonna worship. Can we try that? Today at lunch? Everybody stay here? I'm just kidding. Y'all, y'all just looked at me like I was the devil. Goodness. Ooh, it's hot in here. <laughs> well, we're going to give y'all time to prepare yourself. I know y'all, some of y'all is already, look, we even got people leaving. <laughs> Come on, boom. <laughs> it's important that you fast because when you're fast, you're letting God know that you're serious. So I want to proclaim a fast. No matter what it is, whether it's a, a food, and unfortunately, Facebook is something we fast from nowadays because we spend so much time on it. Whether it's a, a, from Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, you don't even have to tell me about it, but I want you to commit to God that you're gonna find some time to get with him, to fast. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Some of you can't physically fast because of diabetes, I understand that, but whatever you can fast from, I want you to do that. And I want it to be this week, okay? I'm going to fast this week. I don't know what it's going to be from. It might be, I might fast from y'all. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Whatever it is, <laughs> I really want you to do it. And I want you to pray about it because it's important. Because some of these things that we have that are bound up, Jesus told the disciples when they said, hey, we cast out in the name of Jesus, but they wouldn't go. And Jesus said some of this stuff can only be bound up and cast out through prayer and fasting. We always want to, pray but we never want to fast because fasting means you have to give something up and a lot of times until we give something up it doesn't become important to us so give something up this week you can text me what it is if you want I was just kidding and I'll be praying with you okay and while you're fasting have a purpose so okay why am I fasting how's your walk with God you want to dig deeper fast so you can dig deeper so God will reveal some things to you and he will he is faithful and he is just. He'll give you the things, the desires of your heart. But it's important that we have that relationship and that we trust in God so he can direct our paths and which path we need to take, which path we don't need to take. Some decisions are hard decisions that we need help making. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And I love that verse because it says, God, you're right here around me. You show me where I'm going and what's before me and what's happening around me, but you also give me enough light on my path that I can see the direction that I need to go in. He's not gonna show you the end because we're gonna try to help him get there. He's gonna show us just enough to keep us on the right path. Because that's how our faith is built. That's how we grow. That's how we mature as Christians, is not knowing everything. I'm glad I don't know everything. I don't want to know everything. <laughs> um, John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death. So often in our lives, we get this idea or this inclination or we get this desire and all of a sudden we jump on it, all in. Everything we have, we throw everything at this one thing that, God, that we think God is saying and just to find out that we've made a mistake. That's why it's important to have the Holy Spirit. There, seems, there is a way that seems right to a man. The world is teaching us right now to eat, drink, and be merry. The world is telling us right now that you live your best life now. Worry about God later. 
How many of you think that's going to fly when you get to heaven? How many of you are going to stand before the, the judgment seat of Christ and say, I was living a good life, Lord, because the world said it was okay? And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That breaks my heart that that's going to happen to people. There's only one way, church, and that's through Yahweh. That's through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. I don't care what Oprah says, Dr. Phil says. I don't care what the internet says. There is no other way to get eternal life in heaven except through the blood of Jesus Christ being in you and over you and you asking him to be your savior. I know it's not cool to talk about hell and sin and all the things that we go through and everybody wants to hear all the good stuff, but the good stuff ain't always going to get you where you need to go. Sometimes you got to hear the bad stuff to know that you're, you're missing the mark. And I think, church, a lot of us are missing the mark this morning because we're too focused on things that don't even matter. We're storing up treasures on earth instead of treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not corrupt like goodness and mercy and grace. We're so focused on ourselves, we can't help anybody else. It ain't that you don't have the resources to do it, you're just too lazy to do it. At least that's what God is telling me. I'm sure y'all of y'all are doing it. There is only one way, and that's through Yahweh. When we go our own way, we remove ourselves from God's provision. This is a hard one, because when you, when you have the king providing for you, you get the best of the best. When you're a kingdom kid, you get the best of what God has to offer. You get the best houses, houses you didn't even think you deserved. God's going to give it to you because you're a kingdom kid, because you're under his umbrella, because you're a righteous living, because he loves you. When you're, when you're living for the king, you get the best cars. You get the, the best raises. There ain't, I've never had any raises better than the ones I wasn't expecting that God sent. Even though they were less than what I had gotten previously, it was still amazing because God sent it and I wasn't expecting it. That's amazing. God gives the best because he thinks of us as the best. He thinks we're so good that he died for us. When, you, when you're living, uh, when the king's buying for you, you get the best of the best, amen. But when you remove yourself out from the presence of the king, you remove yourself from his provision. And then you find yourself having a wham-wham party. Wham-wham, here I am. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. I got all these bills. I can't pay all my bills. When, you know, just a month ago when I was living righteous, I had everything I needed. Now I'm living in the world. I can't make ends meet. What's happening? There ain't nothing in this world that compares to the provision that God has to offer. And you may not always get what you want, church, but I guarantee you, you always, he'll always give you what you need. Amen. I promise you. And I thank God that he didn't give me everything I've ever wanted. We talked about that last week. I'd have 27 wives right now. Just kidding. Okay, that was a joke. I haven't prayed for that many, okay? It was 26. <laughs> Y'all are so serious this morning. Whew. You may not always get what you want, but you always get what you need. The only thing the world has to offer is counterfeit. The only thing the world has to offer you is counterfeit. God says marriage is a covenant. Satan says, hey, Here's a Jezebel. God says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Satan says, I am here to steal, kill, and destroy. Satan, God says, I am the only way. Satan says, there are many ways. God says, I am more than enough. Satan says, there will never be enough. Who are you listening to this morning? Who are you listening to this morning? Are you under the blood? Or are you under guilt? Are you under conviction? You can have God's way or you can have the world's way, but church, I'm gonna stand here and tell you, you cannot have both. Because that means you're a double-minded man. That means you're unstable in all your ways. In Revelation, uh, I think it's chapter three, Revela um, he says to the Laodicean church, I would that you were war uh, hot or cold, but that you're lukewarm. I'm gonna vomit you out of your mouth. These new translations have watered it down to say spit or, or push. No, vomit is violent, it hurts, it comes from within. So when God vomits you out of his mouth because you're lukewarm, that's on you. There ain't nobody else can do that. You're either hot or you're cold for the Lord. And if you're not either, you need to choose you this day who you're going to serve. Because he's calling you to a higher life, to a higher place of living, to a higher place of provision this morning. 
but you have to make a move. Joshua 24, 15 says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. And then he says this, and I love it. It might be my next tattoo. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How many of you can stand up and say that right now? That it doesn't matter what the schools teach. It doesn't matter what the neighbors are saying. It doesn't matter who's living unrighteous lifestyles. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And even if we're the only people to stand for what we know is right, we're going to do it. Can we, you got anybody that's doing that this morning? It's important. We may be the only Jesus that people see. This son, this, this prodigal son, he made the decision to choose the world, what the world had to offer instead of what the father had to offer. What choices have you made today, church? Can we just close our eyes this morning? And I, I just want you to listen with your heart. Listen with your heart this morning. What choices have you made this morning? Have you decided to follow Christ? Have you decided to follow Jesus, I'm not talking about with your mouth. It's so easy to say I'm a Christian. It's so easy to say I love you, God, with your lips, but it, does your life, does the, the way you live your life line up with that? You can say you're serving the Lord all day long while at the same time running in the opposite direction. I want to ask you this morning, um, how are you living today? Have you asked God, asked God to give you your possessions? Have you, have you, with your actions, told God, you're dead to me? I'm gonna live my way? And if you think about it, and you look back over the course of the last two years, have you grown any? Are you the same place spiritually today that you were two years ago? To me, that's a sign of, of being stagnant. To me, that's a sign of, of not growing, of not moving, of not doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is having daily prayer, having daily fellowship, communicating with God. Because if we're communicating with God, he's setting us on a path that's leading us where we need to go. Verse 12 says, he wasted his possessions on prodigal living. Wasted means used carelessly, extravagantly, to no purpose. Prodigal means spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully, extravagant. It's not about money this morning, but it's about the things that you're wasting in your life. And more often than not, if we're just honest with ourselves, we're wasting time. We're wasting our family's time. We're wasting God's time because our time needs to be about the Father's business. I'm not saying you have to be a robot where you spend every waking moment in prayer and study and fasting, but there has to be a time in your life where you say, Lord, I'm going to do things your way. I'm going to spend some time in the Word. I'm going to spend some time in prayer because I can't keep going the same way I'm going. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. I think we have a, a house full of insane people including myself. We do the same thing over and over and over, but we're expecting different results because our mind is telling us we're doing good, but our flesh is saying, no, you're not. How many of you would say this morning, you hear God speaking to you? How many of you would say this morning, you hear God speaking to your heart? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you this morning about your walk, about your relationship with him, about your, your desires, your hopes, the, the things that he's calling you to do, the places he's calling you to go? Can you hear him? Is there so much going on that you can't hear him? Let's pray for that right now. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. We pray that everything that is in our hearts, in our minds, in our will, in our emotion, in our life that is causing us to not hear you, Holy Spirit, we bind it up in the name of Jesus. We cast it as far as the east is from the west. Open our eyes, remove the scales from our eyes, remove the scales from our heart, remove the scales from our mind so we can enter into a place where we can hear you, Jesus. Because you are the only way.
You're the only one I want leading me and guiding me. You're the only one I want making changes in my life. Now that we've prayed that, ask God again, show me, Lord. Show me what you're telling me. How many of you know Jesus as your Savior? How many of you have a relationship with Christ? Raise your hand. You know that you know that you know that God is my Savior. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you've prayed the prayer and you don't know if it, if it worked. Maybe you have questions about your salvation. Maybe you, you're asking yourself, I wanna know you, Lord. I wanna know you more. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over, getting the same results, so I wanna give you a chance, Lord. I wanna ask you into my life. I wanna ask you to be my savior. If that's you this morning, nobody looking around, just raise your hand. Say, I wanna be saved this morning. I want Jesus in my life. Amen. Amen. Can you, nobody looking around, can you just keep your hands raised for just a moment? Okay. We're going to pray this prayer together. Everybody repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I believe that you died, rose again to newness of life, to give me newness of life. I ask you into my heart to be my savior, to lead me, to guide me, to give me everlasting life with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I saw some of you raise your hand halfway if you prayed that prayer, I just want you to know that now you are born again. Now you're going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. You don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. You are saved. You are saved. Amen. Can we just praise God this morning? Can we thank God for everything good and holy and perfect? Amen. Can we stand and be dismissed this morning?